Hi, my name is Ben Dubarry. I'm a product manager at KeyFactor. Hi, my name is Miguel. I'm the co-founder of Chainloop. And today we're going to look at securing the software supply chain. Let's get into it. So to start, uh, I thought it would be interesting to think about an analogy I like to call baking the cake, or since we're here in uh, Stockholm, baking the fika. So imagine you're a chef and you're looking to make some delicious cake and you might have a set of ingredients, eggs, milk, sugar, and a series of steps you're gonna take, and at the end you expect some delicious cake. But what happens if during that process someone comes along and maybe adds an extra ingredient to this cake you know, uh, at the start, or maybe later on in the process they add something additional, or perhaps a supplier that you were using introduces a package that's malicious, or Maybe your chef is not the most trustworthy person and maybe swaps the recipe out for an entirely different one. These are the kinds of challenges that are facing organizations today when it, look, when it comes to securing your software supply chain. Um, so why is this topic important? So uh, there's been a lot of recent supply chain-based attacks and an increasing number over time. Uh, the popular one people like to look at is SolarWinds, but there's been you know, other instances more recently like the XCUtils attack. Uh, that had you know a project maintainer build up trust in the community and then kind of in introduce a malicious package that thankfully was caught before it caused any serious harm or damage. And I think that case just goes to show you know how interconnected modern software development is and how it's hard to manage these dependencies. And you have effectively at this point applications that might include 20 different open source projects and libraries that those projects might include another 100 open source libraries and projects. And you end up with this complicated web, or maybe a pyramid would be a better analogy, of uh, complex interlinked dependencies for the application that you're ultimately trying to deliver to your customer. On top of that, there's new regulations that are coming. So here in the U EU, we have the Cyber Resiliency Act. Um, so that's basically a, a piece of legislation that's saying, you know, you, you as an organization have a responsibility to deliver secure software to your end customers and users. So. That was a lot of like doom and gloom and bad things that are coming, but the good news is, uh, you know, there's an ecosystem of open source tools that are available today that are going to help solve this problem for you, and we're going to talk about some of those today. So we have this open source software ecosystem where we have these different frameworks, command line tools, and applications that can be used to help secure the software supply chain. But each tool individually and on its own maybe just solves for one small element. And it's really not until you look at each of these, you know, or each of these tools combined together in a whole that you can start to achieve like meaningful steps when it comes to securing the supply chain. So to start, let's look at a framework called Salsa. Uh, so Salsa is part of the Linux Foundation and it's effectively a framework that prescribes a series of steps that an organization can take to s start securing their software supply chain. And so they break the entire build uh, or software delivery pipeline up into multiple different steps and stages. And then they have this concept of these different levels that you can achieve as an organization. And the levels are great because, you know, you as an organization, you know, if you had to start maybe at the top, maybe level four includes a list of a thousand different things you might need to do that involve you know, complex technologies or interlinking multiple different uh, pieces of software together or steps together. But as a smaller organization, you're able to start you know, at level one and kind of build up a foundation that lets you, you know, start somewhere small and then improve over time uh, as you grow and as you uh, become more mature as a business and as your supply chain matures. Um, so today, uh, there's a lot of different pieces and places that we could start when you, know, you look at this framework, but we thought it would be interesting to just look at some open source tools that are available today uh, and some initial steps that you could take when it comes to you know, identifying software artifacts, you know, what's inside of them, where do they come from, can they be trusted. Um, so let's start you know, somewhere simple. So signing a container image, you know, why, would you wanna, uh, why would you wanna do that? So, uh, we're signing a container image helps protect the integrity of the image. So we know the hash of the image and we can see, you know, has this been modified since it was signed? And then we're also able to see, you know, the author of that container image or at least the organization that issued the certificate that was used to sign the image. And by far the most popular tool today to do container image signing is Cosign. 
Um, Cosine comes from a uh, project called SigStore, which is also part of the Linux Foundation. Um, and it's basically a CLI tool for signing, verifying, and storing data in an OCI registry. And I say data because Cosine can be used to sign more things than just container images. It can sign arbitrary blobs of data that you can use and link and store inside of a registry. So you're able to connect additional pieces of data together. Um, using the tool is very simple. Uh, once you have an image in a registry, you can simply you know, sign either with a key that you provide, or you can sign with a key from uh, a different public CA or an integration that Cosign has with a full COCA that SigStore also runs, which makes it very easy to start using as a tool. And then uh, the reason Cosign is so unique is because there's a challenge in that there's no standard way to store an image and you know, some other data and relate the two together in an OCI registry. And so the way Cosign uh, kind of made a clever trick to get around that is when you generate the signature, they basically take the hash of the, or digest of the image and append like a .sig or .sbom to the end of that and then store that in the OCI registry so that when you run verify, you're able to look at, against that particular uh, image digest and see, okay, here's the signature of this image and the image that it belongs to. So when it comes to CA options, there's different uh, CAs that are available to be used. So you know we here at KeyFactor have EJBCA Community, which is an open source project. It can be run in the cloud. It can be run on prem. It can be uh, handle lots of different cloud native use cases beyond just like supply chain certificate issuance. It can be used for other things like Spiffy Inspire to do workflow IDs and other types of tasks. Um, and there's also a, a CA that's included along with the Sigstor project called FullCO, and it's great because one, there's a free public instance that's run, so anyone can start using a tool like Cosign and be signing container images, you know, in about 30 seconds. But the uh, integrations they have with like providers like Google and GitHub let you, you know, you link your uh, accounts to the artifacts that you're signing, and then you can verify those later, or anyone can on their public transparency log recourse. So there's a lot of good options when it comes to certificate authorities. Um, so let's take a look at a software bill of materials. So, you know, why why would you maybe want to look at or produce a software bill of materials? So uh, one reason could be license compliance. So you want to be able to see, you know, what licenses are included in the application that I've created. Look at some vulnerability management things. What are the vulnerabilities that exist? What are the dependencies that exist inside my application? Um, and effectively in SBOM, if we go back to our uh, FICA or cake analogy, is a, an ingredients list. It's the the list of things that went into uh, whatever it is you're running an SBOM against. And that could be a, a container image, it could be a repository, and there's different tools for producing SBOM. So two popular ones are SIFT and Trivi. Uh, and so you're able to run SIFT, there's different formats that you can do, and SIFT's gonna produce output of you know, a, a large file with basically every binary and piece of software that's inside of a given application and it'll show you the license versioning and the version of that binary, and then you're able to basically use that data to build out you know, and look at your dependency management in terms of what versions you wanna have in a particular application and make sure you're meeting those, or to make sure you're staying within the scope of the different licenses that you're consuming inside of your application. Um, another really important area to look at is vulnerability management. And so you can kind of build on the concept of the SBOM and do vulnerability scanning with tools like Trivi and with Gripe, and you can scan the image, you can also do vulnerability scanning of the SBOM, and what that's going to produce is effectively a list of these are the vulnerabilities that are present within this application, and then within the version of the binaries that this application includes. And then you can you know, use that data to make decisions about, you know, do I want this to be able to be run within my environment? Uh, do I need to go back and look at and update a package that I'm using within my application? Um, so it provides really valuable and important information to uh, you know, a software developer. So let's look at our journey so far. So uh, we signed an image, which let us know its author and protect the integrity of that image. But just signing the image by itself doesn't really provide much for us. So we don't know, we signed it, but we don't know necessarily what all was in the image that we signed. Um, and which some ways could be more dangerous because you, you wanna be able to know what's within uh, something that you're deciding to sign because you're saying, you know, hey, I'm responsible for this artifact. I produce this artifact. I know what's inside of this artifact. Um, so to solve that problem, we looked at building an SBOM, which tells us what's included in the application. But just the SBOM alone doesn't let us know, you know the origin of the image and how it's tied to the SBOM or protect the integrity of the SBOM itself. 
And so what we need is a framework that lets us make actionable and trustworthy decisions throughout our software uh, lifecycle, uh, throughout our SDLC, our software supply chain, and not just about even you know, vulnerabilities or license management, but it could be things like QA testing or other types of data that you want to be able to store throughout your supply chain. And uh, Miguel is going to talk about that here now. So thanks, man. Thanks. Um, yeah, exactly. Software delivery is not just about uh, developers uh, writing code. Um, if you want to have uh, delivery um, of software fast and compliant and secure, you actually need all the stakeholders in place. And it's very common that you might have a security team asking you to have a vulnerability management uh, uh, process in place, or a compliance team asking you to uh, make sure that you're using a set of uh, uh, dependencies, uh, a set of licenses, or an SRA team making sure that you are uh, shipping your software fast. And as you can imagine, uh, more and more requirements will come uh, down the line. So you will have now, you will need to start thinking about provenance or build information, about how you're building that software. And that's where it's Salsa Level 3 that uh, Ben mentioned before, uh, it takes into place. Or you might actually might be thinking, how can I share software billow materials? Uh, ben also talked about software billow materials, but what do you do with them? How do you share that to your customers? And of course, you have all this like set of uh, compliance frameworks like SOC2, ISO, so on and so forth. So you can imagine that basically there is like way more requirements than just writing software that needs to be encoded somehow in the software delivery lifecycle as a whole. And for us, um, for Chainloop, we believe that metadata is the bedrock of making any decision. At the end of the day, what we're doing here is making decisions along the way. And there is all these new uh, new standards, new pieces of evidence that we are uh, getting along the along the along the way, like software bill of materials. But there is more. There is QA and test reports, CV scans, uh, or even like manual steps between things for release management. And that's the key, plus automation, to make sure that you can ship software fast in a compliant, secure manner. And we're going to be talking about two main components, two, uh, two foundational components, which are uh, software attestations and policies. So let's start with software attestation. Uh, a software attestation is basically a JSON file that can contain any arbitrary information about a step in the software uh, supply chain. So you can think in the, in the example on the right, you have, for example, a, the software bill of material embedded inside and it has some information about how it was built, the step, the runner, what kind of CI CD system we, was used. But a very important component of an attestation is that it, it is authenticated. It means that you, it's signed and you know the origin and you can actually also verify integrity with it. And this is where a key factor or, or cosign or a six store project comes into play. And the second part is once we have this envelope of metadata with information about how the software was built, how the software was tested, who did it, we need to start making decisions. And for that, you will use a policy engine. In our case, what we're showing here is a open policy engine, which is an open source project as well, where, uh, which allows you to do a declarative, machine readable uh, set of rules that you can apply to any piece of metadata, any piece of evidence. Uh, like attestations, uh, so you can make decisions. On, on the right, you can see an example of how to do vulnerability management easily with a uh, CV report, for example, generated by, by Trivi. So if we put it together um, all the way from signing the image to what we just discussed. So let's say you have uh, your, your CI/CD pipeline all the way from code to release, you have your artifact registry, maybe an OCI registry where you store your container uh, images today, and you have your PKI inf in, uh, infrastructure. You might be using six store project, or you might be using GBC assigned server. What we will have here is the first thing that we will do is to generate the software bill of materials. Let's say when you are uh, building the software, and it will, uh, it will generate that S bomb, but then we will get attested. It will be wrapped into the Intoto uh, attestation, signed in this case with cosign, and then stored in artifact registry. And then down the line, for example, we can do uh, vulnerability management with Trivi, um, 
before uh, we package it in a container image, for example. And at that point, we can generate an output, a, a, a result of that scan, and also a test. It's very important to, to make sure we add this uh, integrity and this authentication uh, um, properties to this metadata. So we will also attest it. And in this case, we're signing it with the sign server, but again, it's part of an intuitive attestation and also stored in the artifact registry. And finally, as I said, you will have the Open Policy Agent engine where you will, uh, you will be able to make decisions on that uh, output of vulnerability management. But this approach doesn't scale. If you, if you can imagine uh, how this will play out in, in a big organization, you will have different teams implementing all these tools by themselves, putting it together, and what you will end up having is a lot of metadata and a lot of practices and tools that are basically scattered across silos. They're inconsistent. They may be optional. Some of them, some teams might be doing uh, one way, some, some of them might be doing a different way. And of course, it's not enforced on the organizational level. So that's why we built Chainloop. We believe that there is a better way. So Chainloop is an evidence store for software supply chain metadata, like attestations, software bill of materials, but more, sorry, file, VEX files. And the key component of Chainloop is we make sure that we create a separation of concerns between the, um, the security teams, product teams, uh, compliance teams on the right side and developers. We make sure that the security teams, product teams will decide what to do with the metadata, how to analyze it, and what kind of metadata is needed. And developers will get a low friction uh, way of onboarding that information into the system in a centralized manner. So Chelo is an open source project. You, you have the link below. So how, how does it work for operators? I just mentioned enforcement. So the, the way it works is Chelo has this concept of contract which is a declarative way of saying what kind of information different steps in the CICD pipeline needs to be sent. So in this case, we are talking here about, if you see the second box on the, on the right side, we're saying, hey, this pipeline needs to run in GitLab, and it needs to send me a cycle on the XSBOM, as simple as that. And what also operators get is this end-to-end -end evidence store with different properties. We, we just talk about attestation format. It will, you will be able to put it together in Toto. Uh, ben mentioned at the beginning all these different tools. So Chainlab actually will give you a pre-configured set of tools. And you will get the end-to-end -end in Toto for attestation, Salsa, and for provenance verification, you can put together either Cosign, but you can use Sign Server. You can, you can bring your own tools um, and PKI and also decide where you want to start. In this case, it's contain uh, OCI registry or use a policy engine like um, Open Policy Agent or Rego. And for developers, for sure, one of the key components of Chainloop is to make sure that they don't have, they don't need to know what's gonna be done with that information. They don't need to know all the requirements that are happening behind the scenes. So we want them to make sure that they keep you know, moving fast so we build a guided attestation process. Attestation at the end of the day, what it means is a guided way of providing information. So for developers, they follow something very similar to Git. We did it on purpose. So you do attestation in it, like Git in it, then you will see what you need to provide, what has been actually the requirements that are being sent to you, and you just provide uh, the information. In this case, you're passing a jar file, and then you're providing also the socket and the X file. The result of then doing attestation push will be automatically behind the scenes. It will run the policies. It will sign. Uh, it will sign the, that that metadata, and it will push it to the control plane, so it's available for other teams to to act upon. And today we are very happy since we are here at, at Key Factor yes. to talk about two integrations that we did. The first one is remote signing with uh, with Sign Server. Uh, and the way it works, I mentioned before that we have attestation in it, which is a process of getting the requirements, and then you will provide the pieces of evidence until you push, you basically generate the attestation with all the information and sign. So that, that last step is where, is where uh, this integration kicks in, which is when we send the attestation payload before signing it to, to sign server, and it will come back sign, and then we'll wrap it in, a, in an envelope. And the way it looks like is doing chain level attestation push, 
passing a, the key a sign server and um, pointing to your sign server worker. And you can think of this like more like a key KMS approach, but this is, this is how it works. And then we have the, the second one, which is uh, it's one of my favorites, um, which basically allows you more like a full show like approach um, that Ben mentioned before. It's, it's, it's such a way that developers, they don't need to have access to the PKI infrastructure by itself. They will get authenticated and automatically they will get an ephemeral certificate to do the signing. So Chainloop will make sure that uh, talk to EGBCA behind the scenes to get a ephemeral certificate that then it will be used uh, transparently. Um, so yeah, you can think more of like full show like approach. And as you can see the command at the bottom, we put it there just because of simplicity, but Chainloop at the station push, there is nothing else to do, which is why I really like it. Yeah, so uh, as we can see, like the combination of EJBCA, Sign Server, and Chainloop, or SigStore, or any of the other open source tools that we talked about today, gives you a lot of options as an organization or as a developer when it comes to looking at ways, you know, or tools you could start using to secure your software supply chain. Um, you know, the design of Chainloop and the way that it's very modular in terms of what it's able to work with gives you a lot of different flexibility uh, when it comes to the implementation. And speaking of implementation, uh, we've done an interactive workshop that we're about to go to next uh, that will walk you through step-by-step -step process of doing what we just talked about with Chainloop and EJVCA and Sign Server. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to our workshop this year. We're gonna be covering the software supply chain security. I'm Sven Ryla and you're probably familiar with me for the last three years of doing these fun tutorials at Community Day. And today I have an awesome guest from Chainloop. Yeah, my name is Jose Ignacio Paris. I'm a founding engineer from Chainloop. Thanks for having me. All right, well, let's jump into what we're gonna look at today. Today we're gonna look at building the container, generating an SBOM, and then scanning that for CVEs. Then we're going to push the container to an OCI registry and sign it with cosign, and then we're going to hop into the chain loop side. Yeah, yeah. And what are we going to cover over there? We will explain what chain loop is. Uh, we will create an SD station and we'll push it to the chain loop. We will glue all the pieces from that station together, and then we will verify that the station with chain loop. Uh, I think it will be very interesting for you. Yeah, I'm super excited. So let's go jump into the tutorial, guys. Okay, first thing we're going to do is log in to our virtual machine. And it's the foo123 password. You know, I love that for my tutorials. It's nice and simple. So we're logging in. Bear with me, it's a little bit slow on the VM. And we're gonna open Firefox here. And this guy will open up. Wonderful. And we have it bookmark on the top here. We'll click on that Jupyter Notebook to go to the tutorial page where we wrote the steps all out of what we're gonna follow today. We got a nice little simple explanation of the pieces we're gonna cover again, like we just talked about. And we'll hop right into the first step, which is going to be building the container. We have a little simple to-do app, so we'll click the play button, and this builds the container from the Docker file. The next thing we want to do is let's start the container to take it for a test drive to make sure it actually builds. So we'll click the play button again, run this curl command. We should get some simple output in JSON and make it format nicely with JQ. And then we can stop the container. And then we're going to get into the Trivi side. Let's pause here for a second. Jose, why is Trivi, what, what are we doing with this? And why is this kind of important as we yeah, get into this next this step? It's important that everyone is talking today about S-Bones. S-Bones is a bill of material, which components are inside your image, inside your software. This is very important in order to detect vulnerabilities and, 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 and have that whole transparent yeah, view of everything that's included, everything right? Everything is included in the pipeline, in, the, in the, your process, right? Um, Trivi is one of the tools that we can use for this. And Trivi is not only giving us the SBOM, it's also giving us the vulnerability report, which is something important as well. So we will talk about that later. Uh, we will be using Sarif format for that. Yeah, that's a term I keep hearing a lot. Why does that matter? Yeah, Sarif is uh, getting very popular these days, right? Uh, GitHub, for instance, is using Sarif for all the reports that you can see in their site. I think it's getting very popular. It's generic enough to cover all of the different scenarios. Oh, so it's so, just very versatile, in other words. Yeah, yeah. okay. And Microsoft's pushing it since they own GitHub. Good to know. All right, so let's go now and actually make the SBOM a Trivi. So we'll click on the play button here now, and we'll generate the SBOM. And then the next one here is to click play 
on the image one to do the CV scanning. So we'll actually, it's going to download a database. So it's pulling the latest yeah. update and then it's going to scan the container and give us the output in the serif format. The next thing we want to do now is start the containers. So click the little box here in the play button to start the containers. And obviously for speed's sake, we did launch this up because this took about three minutes on the VM, but I didn't have the patience for that in the video. So this was only five seconds. All right, the next thing we want to do is export the container from Docker. And we'll pause here for a second and talk about that. Why am I doing that? Well, we're doing that because Docker, even though they say they're OCI compliant, if you could see the air quotes here, they do not push functionally to the OCI registry and OCI compliant registry. Yeah. Therefore, if we export the image to tar file, we can actually use other tools out there to push it to an OCI registry, right? Yeah, exactly. It's the, the main type that Docker is using. It's not fully OCI compliant. So we need to convert that to OCI format for that. And in this case, we'll be using Scopio to do that. So we've exported it. Now the next thing we're going to do, let's run that Scopio login command to log into our registry. And then we'll push the container now. So we'll click the play button there to push it up to the registry. And we'll give that a second. It's going to push all those layers up. And now that we have that and scrolling down, yep, you can see that all went up. Great. Let's open up the other tab now. And we will go to our local registry container. And we'll log in with the username user. So we'll type that in. And then our password, the foo123. Again, simple passwords, that way we know what they are. Never do this in production. All right, and we see this little shield here. It's not signed. All right, we expect that, right? Containers built, pushed, now we gotta sign it. So now we'll hop into the next step here, which is going to be pulling the metadata down from the registry. So we'll use the cosign generate command to pull that down to a JSON file. And we can do a little parse of that with JQ to see what does this really look like? Because this is what we're going to actually go get signed by sign server. So that's the payload. Let's send that up to sign server to get signed. So click the play button. And then we're going to convert that signature from Duren coding over to base64. So we'll convert it. Our next step is to then push this payload up to the registry. So we'll push that up with that command. And then we'll do a little cleanup here and click the last box and the play button. And now that that's pushed and cleaned up, let's go check and do a refresh over in the registry tab. Now we can see it's green and we have a signature. So now the container signed and now we're going to get to the fun part where chain loop comes in. So let's pause and talk about what we're going to do here, Jose. Yeah. Uh, so far we have a container image, we have the signature, we have the S-bone, we have the CVE vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, this may be enough for some organizations. This may be enough because we have all the pieces, but they are not glued together, right? We don't have a single piece of evidence that says this is the document, this is, this is the S-bone, this is the Sarif uh, vulnerability report, this is the image, and everything is related to each other. Uh, this is called attestation. This is what uh, everyone is talking about today. And uh, that's what Shapeload is helping uh, organizations to, to do. So basically, we are creating attestations. Uh, one if, uh, everyone is talking about in total attestations, right? Yeah, that, that's that? everywhere. That was so prevalent at the KubeCon this year yeah. in Paris. And I'm really interested to see how much they talk about that at the yeah. North America one now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, Shapeload is creating those in total attestations. They are uh, creating uh, the document with all the pieces that we have created so far. The document, uh, the, the image, the s bone the uh, TV report, everything. And it is signing uh, with sign server. We will see that now. And uh, pushing it to an evidence store. So this uh, is a store in the organization level. And then you can query it later on to create your, your own uh, workflows, your own uh, contract gates for your deployments, for instance. So it's very funny, that part. And then we do need to say, this is obviously not by any means a production deployment. No. Nope. We've really simplified the configuration of this down, where in a production one, you would actually be logging into this. But for the sake of the tutorial, we kept this very simple to just set up the configuration file, add the OCI registry that we'll get into, 
yeah. where we're going to push the artifacts. But the, just bear in mind that this is nice and simple for you guys to be able to do this at home or at your office to try this out. Yeah, in the normal workflow, you will do a chain loop of logging. You will get the credentials using a single sign-on workflow. In this case, we are not doing that because we need to open a, a different browser uh, and the console. So in this case, we are just uh, doing this trick about getting the token from the logs and put, putting the token into the configuration file. All right, this so, is in development mode only. Yeah, okay? so let's hop into doing that. So the first thing we're going to do, like Jose just said, is we'll grab the token out of the logs. Yeah. So we run that step. The next thing we need to do is create the organization. So let's talk yeah. about what is the organization? Yeah, organization, chain loop is multi-tenant by default. So you can have as many organizations as you want. They are isolated in their in their control plane. So basically you create an organization, you add users with some roles in the organization, and you can uh, create tokens for those users so that they can create other stations in the organization. Okay, uh, We will see that. At the organization level, we can see that we can create some resources like the CAS backend. This is where the stations are going to be stored. Ooh, let's, let's do that in the next step. So let's mm -hmm. go. So now we're actually going to pop open a terminal mm -hmm. and we're going to copy this command here for adding a CAS backend. So we'll copy it, we'll open the terminal here, and all we have to do is paste it. And then we'll hit enter and press Y for yes. And then we'll stretch the window out because obviously I don't like looking at smush data. So we unsmush it. Yeah. And let's pause here and talk about what, what do we got now, Jose? We've added this registry. Yeah, we added this registry as the default backend for chain loop, which means that all of the stations and the materials that we are adding to those other stations are going to be stored in that OCI registry. Can I put those anywhere else? Yeah, you can put that in S3 buckets, for instance. Ooh, okay. You can configure an Azure uh, blob storage. So you have different options. It depends on your organization or how you are. Uh, like where I want to store it, right? Yeah, so exactly. I'm not locked into just one way. I've got some options here. Yeah, this is at the organizational level. So you can configure different organizations with different store options, right? Oh, nice. That's awesome flexibility. So now let's get into creating a workflow. So scroll down in our tutorial here. And the first thing is to create a workflow. So Jose, before we click the play button, can yeah. you tell me what is a workflow? A workflow is a... a it can represent anything, any any pipeline or any process in your organization. So like anything right? I'm going to build exactly. is a workflow, right? Like yeah. I'm going to go compile some code, that's, yeah. that's a workflow. So a workflow is something that you build in your organization, you have a process and you have some artifacts as an output, right? You want to attest everything that you are producing in that, work, in that pipeline, you want to attest it. So that's a workflow. You are attesting the result of running workflows, right? Okay, so let's go and run our command. We'll create a workflow. Yeah. And then, ooh, we're going to add a contract. So before we click, actually, let's click play on that. Let's do it. And let's scroll down here and look at the output. Yeah. So we got that on screen. So we scroll down a little bit. All right. We're pausing here. What is this contract about, Jose? Yeah. By default, every workflow has a contract, right? And the contract by default is empty, which means that you can add any material, any, any artifact any to the, to the, to the workflow result. So you're station. saying, like, I, could, I got to require a container. Exactly. I can't do this workflow without a container. Yeah. Or you have to have an S bomb and a container, but yeah, any, if you want to add other things, those could be optional. Board. Yeah, it could be anything, anything that you are producing in your process. Usually, you will you will add S bombs, CB reports, um, and some kind of artifact. Yeah, right? Exactly. Any any artifact that you are producing and you want to attest them together. Uh, in this case, we are uh, creating a custom workflow. Uh, which uh, we have a, a mandatory material, which is a container image. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so if we see that there, it's the one right under the materials. Yeah. And something that we added very recently is that you can add policies. So, what are the different restrictions that you want? Uh, yeah. What are the policy? What, what what can I do with that? Tell me about it. Yeah. A policy means, for instance, you are adding. You, we can see the, these examples, right? Uh, you are adding an S bomb. It needs to be fresh. It no, it needs so to I be, can't do something that's like 30 days old. Yeah, this is too old. Maybe it's too old because the the Trivi database maybe is changing and maybe you are it's not detecting or the Trivi tool is, is changing. Maybe it's not detecting a tool that now it can detect. So this is this is usually a requirement for well, in some organizations. Kind of a good thing too, right? Then yeah. you're never using something old. You're always making them give me the latest and greatest. Yeah, or maybe licenses. Uh, oh, your oh. organization doesn't allow you uh, to have uh, a GPL licenses for some reason. So right? I can enforce licenses in the code to flag that. Or even components and versions of components. Wow. Right. 
It's very uh, flexible. Exactly, it's from the spawn. Or maybe you can enforce that you want an spawn. Is that the latest policy that we can see in the example? I want an spawn to be present. Spawn can be in different formats. It can be in Cyclone DX, it can be in SPDX or any other format. This policy, for instance, is taking care that you are actually adding an spawn in any format, but you are adding it. So I can even lock down that I only want Cyclone DX, nothing else. Exactly. Wow. All right. So now that we got that, the next thing we need to do is export this token variable out. And that token variable, I guess, is what you'd put on your runner where the, the build's going to go, right? Exactly. This is usually in, in the pipeline. This is a, like a service account. This is something that is not, uh, it doesn't allow you to, uh, to, to modify anything at the organization level. It's just only at the workflow level. So this is usually you put in the pipeline, yes. All right, and then before we click on the attestation init command, why don't we talk about now what the attestation is? I mean, we've mentioned a lot of the pieces, but yeah. this is kind of really getting into the crux of this whole workshop of the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, an attestation is usually a document where you are adding the different materials that you are creating in your workflows, in your pipelines. Uh, we mentioned that the format today in total attestation is getting very popular. Um, an attestation is including not only this document, the document could include the digest of the, of the container image, for instance, mm -hmm. or the s bonds or anything else that you want to add. But it's also uh, including a signature. So you're, you are signing so the whole... So you're testing that, ah, exactly. this is what I actually did. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in this case, we are supporting sign server as a uh, signing method. So which means that everything will be compliant in your organization. Um, and you can even configure sign server for ephemeral certificates and, and so on. So you can have more advanced scenarios. Yeah, you can handle a lot more use cases for how your company wants to leverage PKI with this integration. Yeah. You're not limited to just this way. Yeah, There's exactly. many ways to do this. Yeah. Shellu supports uh, several signing methods. I think sign server is, is the most interesting one. Right I'm now. a bit biased, so I'm going to have to say yes. <laughs> All right, so let's click on the little play button here to go and create our attestation called build release. So now we have our attestation. Then we're going to go and we're going to add stuff. Let's add the yeah. container to it. So we click that step and now we've added the container. And then the next one is to add the S bomb. The S -bomb. And the last one we're going to do let me is. Pause, let me pause for a second. Ooh, here. Okay, talk about okay. that. Yes, you can see in the logs, we are evaluating the policies, right? Uh huh. So let's see that we are evaluating the policy, the freshness policy, which means that. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, but the, we cannot see any violations, which means that we passed. We passed the policy, All right. right? I get my sticker for the day, yeah. my gold star. You go green. You went green, yes. <laughs> and also the, the band license. We don't have any band licensing or response, which is good, OK? All right, so let's go and do the next one for yeah, the server. And actually, it's detecting the, the material type, yes? It's oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. It auto detects it. It's like yeah. DX. OK, so now we're going to go and add the CVE report. This one, why? Oh. So let's pause and talk about that. Why is this generating so much output here? Yeah, this is an all. We, we did this on purpose. We did? OK. OK, okay, okay. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the simple to do the application that we just built. Yeah. It's using an old version of uh, Golang. Golang. Of Golang, yes. Uh, which means that we are, that's why we are getting We so got a lot many. of problems yeah. with this, with vulnerabilities, yeah. obviously, from that report. If we use the RSM1, we didn't get any. Uh, but this is a good example. We are we are evaluating this policy and we are getting the results. It's, it's telling us, hey, take care because we are having several uh, CVEs in this container. Uh, something we want I want to say is that we are not blocking the attestation. So we are actually attesting that something is wrong. Yeah, because you're, okay? you're, you're, you're so you're allowing me to build it. I'm submitting my proof that this was a CVE, knowing that okay, I had all these problems, but. Yeah, I can still attest that, hey, I built it like this, even though, yeah, there was a lot of CVEs in it. Yes. yes. Okay. So let's go to the next one then and actually run the attestation full to actually look at everything that's in our everything. attestation before we sign it. So click the play button. There we go. And let's pause for a second and look at So now we can see in that, right, Jose, we've got the container the S-bomb and our CVE. And, CVE. and the next thing we'll do is run the next command now to go and sign it with sign server. Yeah, this is the most interesting part as well, because we, we, we are using a, a sign server 
that we are running in organization. So we need to specify the, the URL of the worker. And there we go. It's signed. It's signed. So now what we're going to do is grab that ETA station ID up top. So we'll select that. And then we're going to paste it down below in the next, the attestation underscore ID equals. Make sure we paste that. And then click the play button. And now we're going to get, we're verifying the signature now. Yeah. And this gives a lot of output. As you can see in the command line, we are telling verify equals true, which means that we are getting the signature, or we are getting the payload, or we are comparing the, uh, we are doing the verification, right? With the, with the certificate. Uh, so this is signed and stored in the evidence store in chain loop. So that means it's going to, in chain loop, but does it also write that to the OCI registry then? Exactly, you can okay. check the OCI registry, you will see that the station there. All right. But then we end up going, let's just, we'll shut down the containers, yeah. and then we can wrap that up and yeah. get ready to, uh, we also have some contact information at the bottom there if you're curious about how to get in touch with any of us. Sure. And yeah, so we stop the containers, and let's uh, go wrap this up. All right, guys, we hope you enjoyed our tutorial. As you can see, definitely better together. When we take chain loop and mix that with some EGBC and sign server, you can do some really amazing things to be able to secure your software supply chain really easy. Yeah, quite easy. Yes. I, I mean, agree. for me, how could you make that any simpler to be able to, to sign and then leverage chain loop to do the attestation and do your builds like this? I mean, yeah. it's pretty it's awesome. Amazing. So, yeah. It. Thanks for coming to the tutorial, guys, and we'll see you at the live workshop at Community Days. Yeah. All right, take care.